balanced and never really opinionated. Uh, I'm interested in why on earth you tackled uh, Mother Teresa as a, as a missionary position. Christopher, I'm sure you have a the yeah. audience. Uh, I was asked uh, why some of my uh, natural uh, tenderness and pudeur <laughs> and fair mindedness would. And by the way, one must confuse fair mindedness with objectivity. You, you know how people often do that in this culture. People say even they think even handedness is objectivity or fairness is objectivity or uh, including both sides. There's not objectivity is the search for truth, even if it leads you to unwelcome conclusions. Uh, it's nothing at all to do with impartiality. But none of these things apply to the case of Mother Teresa because it's a, a simple matter of record that she was a fanatic and a fundamentalist and a fraud. Um, <laughs> I think probably the most, the most successful confidence trickster of the last century um, and responsible for innumerable deaths and for un untold suffering and misery and proud of it. Um, do you, should I just assert this or would you require any proof? <laughs> We know how fair-minded some people can be. I just John Roger and Charles Keating for example. Well, Thank you, John. There's one way, there are three ways, two, two ways to do it. One is you say, well, if she was so wonderful, how come she went to Haiti at the invitation of the Duvalier family, took money from them, which didn't belong to them, had been stolen from the Haitian poor, said how wonderful the situation was for the poor in Haiti, how the poor loved the Duvaliers and the Duvaliers loved them back. How did she get to Haiti in the first place? She's supposed to be in Calcutta. You've got to get all the way to Haiti to praise a regime that is notorious for its ringing of the poor. Oh, she did it because out of solidarity with people who thought like her and because she needed their money, which they'd stolen. As she stole hers from Charles Keating of the Lincoln Savings and Loan, who gave her a million and a half dollars and a private jet in return, pretty good deal actually, for an olive crucifix and a blessing <laughs> when he was on trial. Uh, he needed a character witness. <laughs> the, court, the court then wrote to her and said, you've got a million and a half of the dollars we're looking for that belong to the poor of California. Do you feel like giving it back? She never replied. Uh, she went to the court with us. That's just the fraudulence. That's, uh, that's just touching on the fraudulence. But by the way, if, if, any, if any of what I've just said is true, and it all is, how come you need me to tell you? How come that my profession hasn't enlightened you about this already? How come this woman stands underneath a Niagara of undiluted free publicity for all these years? Ask yourselves. But that's just the fraud. As for the fanaticism and the fundamentalism, look, she said that poverty was a gift from God and should be accepted, should be welcomed. She believed that uh, disease and poverty were necessary for the formation of a good character. And she opposed um, the only thing that uh, is known to cure, <laughs> excuse me, to cure poverty. There is only one known cure for poverty. It's very simple. It doesn't matter whether you go to Bangladesh or Basra or Bolivia. Um, if you can give women control over their rate of reproduction, uh, and come back to that village in 10 years' time, everything will be better, right away. It's the only thing that works. If you can throw in a handful of seeds and a bit of credit as well, and ge generally try and funnel it through the, the mothers and the wives, it will be enormously better right away. But it, nothing else works. If you don't do it, people die all the time very horribly, and they have appalling diseases like polio that they can spread to other people. Well, Mother Teresa spent her entire life saying that that solution was impermissible. She waged her entire life making sure that didn't happen. So I wish there was a hell to which she could go. Because she has a lot of death on her conscience, and a lot of misery, and stupidity, and ignorance, and dirt, and filth, and disease as well. Poison, a poisonous woman patronized by a poisonous person, whose national security advisor she was, while she could, while they could both breathe. I don't miss them, and nor should anybody else. Religion, religion is the enemy. How, is how long, how much is it going to take to convince us? <laughs> faith, faith is not a virtue. If it was, it would be the most overrated of the virtues. <laughs> no question. Thank you, and you were admirable in your timing. I didn't have to do this at all to uh, tell you that uh, you were coming to the end of your time. Our next speaker is Christopher Hitchens. He's arguing against the motion. Christopher Hitchens is uh, British by origin, but he has spent most of his 
working life in the United States. He is a writer, journalist, and commentator, particularly well known for his um, trenchant and uh, views and very original thinking. He works on Vanity Fair magazine, where he memorably wrote uh, a rather a less than complimentary profile, I would have to say, Christopher, of uh, the late Mother Teresa. Uh, so, Christopher Hitchens, let us hear what you have to say. Your time starts now. Please make your way to the podium. Well, Your Grace, um, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, um, and Zena, who did something that I almost never have had experienced before, uh, paid a compliment to my shirt before we came on. So I was able to return by pointing to hers, which you, you're feasting your eyes on now, and saying, I once saw Norman St. John Stevens, now Lord Stevens of Forley, wearing a shirt just like that on the television. And he was asked by his interviewer, gosh, what a lovely shirt, where did you get it? And Sivas said, do you really like it? He said, I, I call it sort of crushed cardinal. <laughs> I might add, in the spirit of fraternity, which I'm sure will inform this entire soiree, that the mere existence of Lord Sivas of Foley is testimony to the breadth of the church. Um, now, I'm sorry, though, to have to begin by disagreeing with His Grace. Um, if you're going to be a serious grown-up person and appear to defend the Catholic Church in public in front of an educated and literate audience, you simply have to start by making a great number of heartfelt apologies and requests for contrition and forgiveness. Now you might ask, you're fully entitled to ask, brothers and sisters, who am I to say that? Well, in the Jubilee Millennium Year of 2000, the Vatican spokesman, Bishop Piero Marini, said, explaining the whole sermon of apology given by His Holiness the Pope, that was supposed to cover the entire history of the Church in its Jubilee year, that I'll quote uh, Bishop Marini directly, he said, given the number of sins we've committed in the course of 20 centuries, reference to them must necessarily be rather summary. Well, I think Bishop Marini had that just about right. I'll have to be summary too. But I think he said just about the least of it. His Holiness on that occasion, it was March the 12th, 2000, if you wish to look it up, begged forgiveness for, among some other things, the Crusades, the Inquisition, the persecution of the Jewish people, injustice towards women, that's half the human race right there, <laughs> and the forced conversion of indigenous peoples, especially in South America. And that followed a whole series of preceding apologies, or apologies, I would say, of a kind, made by the late Pope John Paul, who, it troubles me not at all to say, was a very impressive and serious human being. Um, it followed no less than 94, 94 count them, uh, public recognitions on his part of appalling crime and error and cruelty and stupidity and offenses to the free intelligence, ranging from I shall be summary, like Bishop Marini. The African slave trade, apologized for in 1995. Uh, the admission that Galileo was right <laughs> about the relationship between the sun and the earth and other orbs, which came in 1992, one might add, I won't say, it's too easy to say better late than never. Here, I said it. <laughs> to violence and torture, legalized torture. Torture was legalized and institutionalized by the Roman Pontiff uh, during the Counter-Reformation. That came in 1995. Um, and uh, for silence during Hitler's final solution, or Shoah. As well as, in 1999, coming in just under the Millennium Jubilee Wire, an apology for the burning alive in the main square of Prague of the great Czech Protestant Jan Hus. Um, since that big fiesta of forgiveness that uh, began in, or uh, well, culminated, I might say, in 2000, Fiesta of Forgiveness, Fiesta of Asking for It. The papers he's also asked to be forgiven for the sack of Constantinople and the massacre of Byzantine Christianity in April 1204 as part of the Fourth Crusade, the anathema on all Eastern Orthodox Christians as unbelievers, heretics, and people dwelling outside the health of the church was lifted only in 1964. I call your attention to that. 
He also expressed sorrow about the murder and forced conversion of Serbian Orthodox Christians in the Balkans during the Second World War. <coughs> and it doesn't end there. There are smaller but significant, um, equally significant, avowals of a very bad conscience. These have included uh, regret for the rape and the torture of orphans and other children in church-run schools in almost every country on earth, from Ireland to Australia. And I'm pleased to see that due reconsideration is now being given, and may in fact have been given, to the helpish, I choose the word carefully, doctrine of limbo, St. Augustine's uh, cruel and stupid disposal problem solution to a non-existent problem, that is to say, the destination of the souls of unbaptized children. Up until now, Catholic parents have been taught that's where their unbaptized children went, a form of torture that's sometimes worse than the physical. Now it seems that this piece of Augustinian sadism is undergoing reconsideration as well. But remember, this is from a church that, on the whole, cannot err. We still await a more direct admission. For example, I would give some suggestions of my own while we're at it. I would like them to take back the Concordat made with Adolf Hitler, the first treaty he ever signed, giving the church a monopoly over education in Germany in exchange for the dis dissolution of the Catholic Central Party to give the Nazi Party a clear run. I apologize for the latter and pact with Mussolini, myself, also the first treaty ever signed by that fascist dictator. I would also think I'd want to reconsider the fact that Father Tizo, head of the Nazi puppet state of Slovakia, was a priest in holy orders that the Croatian fascist puppet state, the Ustasha state of anti Pavlic, was also operating under full clerical protection and disguise, as was the regime of General Franco and the dictator Antonio Salazar. And I'd also want, I really think I would beg forgiveness for this, I don't think the German church should have asked Hitler's birthday to be celebrated from the pulpit every year until he died. These are very serious matters, and they're not to be laughed off by references to the occasional work of Catholic Charities, but I draw your attention not just to the apologies, ladies and gentlemen, but to the evasive and euphemistic form that they take. Uh, Joseph Ratzinger, the current Pope, considered by some, by Catholics, to be the Vicar of Christ on Earth, says of Indians, that of the Indians who were massacred in the course of conversion in Brazil, after the apology had been made to them, he said, nonetheless, it must be remembered that before we came to convert them, they were silently awaiting the arrival of the church. I don't think that's a very genuine kind of apology to you. In his comment, one of the few he's made on the institutionalization of rape and torture and maltreatment of children in Catholic institutions, he has said, it's a very severe crisis which, which involves us, he said, in the following, in the need for applying to these victims the most loving pastoral care well, I'm sorry. They've already had that. <laughs> and to say that this is the responsibility laid upon you by the, the horrific admission that you've already had to make is not accepting responsibility in any adult sense. When I say child abuse was institutional, how dare I say so? How can I prove it? How can I prove such a thing? Well, I'll ask, the, I'll ask His Grace. And I'll ask Anne Whitcomb. Where is Cardinal Bernard Law now? Where is he? Where is the Cardinal Archbishop of Boston, whose resignation was indignantly demanded, finally, by 50 members of the church and by the whole laity of Massachusetts, who also demanded his prosecution for the promotion and protection and covering up and uh, apology for and defense of uh, people and defense of uh, people whose crimes against children are too revolting to specify? And he's not in the jurisdiction of Massachusetts now, as perhaps you know. He's the Supreme Vicar of the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, personally appointed by the Pope to that as well as many other important sinecures. And in 2005, this man, a fugitive from justice and from, and from complicity in the filthiest crime that it's possible for a human being to imagine, was one of those voting in conclave to decide who the next Vicar of Christ on Earth will be. I don't know. I think, I think I'd like to hear a bit more shame about this. I think I'd like to see a bit more confrontation with the, with the, with the reality of the business. Now, this is a, a, a serious question, as I've said. And Whitaker very often rightly, in my opinion, attacks the climate of moral relativism and of anything goes that can 
very well be the handmaiden of postmodernist Hellenistic culture. I very often am glad that she points these thing, things out. But the rape and torture of children is not something to be relativized. It's not something to be excused as a few bad priests. It's certainly not to be excused by the hideously false claim made by some Catholic conservatives that this wouldn't have happened if queers hadn't been allowed into the church. I'm sorry to say that queer living in the church is an old story too. Um, and it's worse, it's much worse than pornography, and it's much worse than bad language on TV. And it's the crime that cries out for punishment. It's the thing that if we were accused of on this side of the house, we would die rather than admit. And if we were guilty of it, we'd kill ourselves. And it's the one thing the church has decided to excuse itself for under this papacy. The same euphemism comes in the term some Christians that is used in all the apologies about the, the Crusades, the Inquisitions, uh, the anti-Semitic pogroms, and all the rest of it. It says some Christians fell into error. Some Christians allowed themselves to be, to be uh, uh, deceived in this way and to act against the gospel. Well, anti-Semitism was preached as an official doctrine of the church until 1964. Do you think that might have something to do with public opinion in Austria and Bavaria and Poland? and Lithuania, that the, the Jewish people were accused collectively as a people of deicide, of the crime of the murder of God in the figure of Jesus of Nazareth. And that, that anathema on them was not lifted until 64, well after the uh, perpetrators of the Holocaust had stood trial in secular courts and been rightly punished for their actions. How can this church say it has any moral superiority? It has difficulty catching up to what ordinary people regard as common moral and ethical sense, and it still can't make itself apologize properly, and I'll tell you why. Because, and I'll quote again from the encyclicals, it is said of the Crusades, of the complicity with the Holocaust, of the political and diplomatic alliance with fascism, of all of these things, it is said, well, violence was committed, but I'll stress this, I'll underline it, I'll quote directly, in the service of the truth. So how is an apology possible? How is any understanding or undertaking or firm purpose of amendment to be allowed when the original sin, so to say, the radix malorum, the fons et origo, the problem in the first place, is the belief on the part of this church that it does possess a truth that we don't have, and it does have a God-given right, a warrant, a mandate of heaven to tell other people what to do, not just in their public, but in their private lives. And until that is changed, until that fantastic and sinister and non-founded claim is changed, these crimes will go on repeating themselves, being partially denied, partially admitted when it's too late to do anything else, and covered up. Behind all these crimes and miseries is the denial of what we on this side of the house affirm, which is that the only little candle of hope that our species does possess, our, our poor bare forked primate, mammalian species, of whom you have two such splendid examples on this side of the house, and not bad on the other tonight, um, is, the, is the unfettered in intelligence, the method of free inquiry in philosophy and in science, and the, the refusal to admit that any one person can tell you not to do that. It's the one thing I might say, I think, is, if not sacrosanct or sacred, is, shall we say, essential. And the church has always stood and still stands against it. Now, in the little time remaining to me, I'll just propose a few more apologies that we might hope to hear uh, in the immediate future. Because there'll come a time when the church will issue apologies and explanations and half-baked appeals for forgiveness for things it's still doing. The readmission as a bishop of Roger Williamson, a member of Marcel Lefebvre's fan fanatical hysterical breakaway sect, so-called Society of St. Pius X. Roger Williamson found hiding in a reactionary, quasi-fascistic establishment in Argentina has long been a believer that, I'll put this shortly, that the Holocaust did not occur, but the Jews did kill Christ. In other words, in other words <clears throat> genocide, no, deicide, yes. He was quite rightly excommunicated some years ago, along with several other members of his ratbag organization. But Joseph Ratzinger's invited him back in to the communion because to him, having this man, this liar, this fraud, this racist, in the church is more important because it's church unity 
than the things that he said and done and continues to stand for. Is this not a crime scandal? I think that there will be an apology for what happened in Rwanda, the most Catholic country in Africa, one of the most Catholic countries in the world, um, where priests and nuns and bishops are on trial for inciting from their pulpits and on the churches, radio stations and newspapers the massacre of their brothers and sisters. Uh, and the papacy was silent on this appalling occasion. And everyone in Rwanda knows it. And there hasn't yet been a properly written apology for that disgrace. Staying in Africa, I think it will one day be admitted with shame that it might have been in error to say that AIDS is bad as a disease, very bad, but not quite as bad as condoms are bad, or not as immoral in the same way. I say it, I say it in the presence of His Grace, and I say it to His face, the preachings of His Church are responsible for the death and suffering and misery of millions of his brother and sister Africans. And he should apologize for it. He should show some, some shame. Fourth, for condemning my friend Stephen, Stephen Fry, for his nature, for saying, for saying you couldn't be a member of our church, you were born in sin. There's a revolting piece of casuistry that's sometimes often on this point. Yeah, we hate the sin only. We, we love the sinner. Stephen is, I'm sorry to say, not quite like other girls. It's his nature. <laughs> Actually, he is like other girls in that the he's, when I last checked, absolutely boy mad. Um, he's not being condemned for what he does, he's being condemned for what he is. You're a child made in the image of God. Oh no, you're not. You're a faggot. And you can't join our church and you can't go to heaven. This is disgraceful, it's inhuman, it's obscene, and it comes from a clutch of hysterical, sinister virgins who've already betrayed their charge in the children of their own church. For shame, for shame. And finally, under this Pope, as if it wasn't bad enough to try and restore the Latin Mass to gratify the mad fascistic followers of Archbishop Lefebvre. Oh, uh, but to begin again to offer remission of sin, as Cardinal, as Bishop Ratzinger, the Pope, I'll call him the Pope for heaven's sake, uh, uh, wants to do. Uh, if you come to a Catholic youth festival in Sydney, Australia, where I just was, you'll get a certain remission from poetry or hell. It may be temporary if you come a lot and you give a lot, you'll get possibly permanent remission from the eternal punishment that they don't know any more about than you and I do. This is the sale of indulgences blatantly, openly, or it's the same temptation that was offered to those who set off on that fourth crusade that's just been apologized for, and killed all the Jews of Europe on their way, sacked Byzantine Christianity when they got to Constantinople, and then went on to massacre the Arabs and Muslims. They were offered paradise if they died committing these terrible crimes against humanity. But the, if you see what I mean, therefore, the stimulus to crime, the impetus to crime, the belief in certainty, the, the belief that a divine warrant entitles you to do whatever you like, is the sin that must be, that must be cancelled, that must be annealed, that must somehow be uh, apologized for. Now, I don't, I don't wish any, I, I'm, I, that's perfect timing. I don't wish, I don't wish any ill on any fellow primate or mammal of mine, even if this primate or mammal claims to be a primate in possession of a secret that's denied to me. I can forgive even that because I live in a country where their reign doesn't run, their writ doesn't apply, and they can't burn me and silence me and censor me any more than they can tell my wife she can't use contraception, or any more than they can really tell Stephen that he's a beast. Um, so I, not, I don't at all look forward to the death of, uh, of Joseph Bratzinger, I don't, or any other pope, not really, um, except for one tiny reason which I ought to confess and share with you. When he dies, there's quite a long interval till the conclave can meet, maybe Cardinal Law will still be on it, to pick another pope. Sometimes it goes on for months until they get the white smoke. And for that whole time, that whole interval, it's a delicious, lucid interlude, there isn't anyone on earth who claims to be infallible. 
Isn't that nice? All I think, all I want to propose in closing is this, that if the human species is to rise to the full height that's demanded by its dignity and by its intelligence, we must all of us move to a state of affairs where that condition is permanent, and I think we should get on with it. Okay, thank you for having me.